please join me in prayer. Oh, Father, we are so grateful that we can come to you after all that we've done. And you still welcome us in through the blood, the graphic, despicable scene of your son, Jesus Christ, being whipped, scourged, bleeding, shedding blood so that each one of us can be welcomed into your presence. Father, as we continue today to praise and worship you, we humbly ask that you open our hearts and our minds to hear what you have to say through me today. Father, I pray that it is you that is speaking, that it is you the people are praising. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity through the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. And it's in his mighty name we come to you, Dad. Amen. Now, the power of choice is very sacred to God. In fact, it's so sacred to God that he would not violate that even though it cost him his own life. You know, when you process this, I would think God would be in, had been able to manipulate the serpent in the garden if he wanted to. He could have manipulated Adam and Eve so that they could have never chosen sin. And because of that, we must conclude that in the infinite wisdom of God, a higher happiness and a greater good for the universe is going to come out of the lessons that have been learned through man's fall and redemption. And I start with that today because so many of us don't understand this yet. Even though some of what you're about to hear again, you've heard multiple times. Choice is a very powerful thing God has given us. Now today, we're going to dig into the environment that most influences our choices. And right from the start, I'm going to give you the answer. And the answer is our emotional state will determine our choices more than any other factor around. And because of that, the scriptures, the entire word of God from beginning to end in this book we call the Bible is pleading for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we are then filled with a resource that has eternal heavenly objectives guiding it, opposed to the temporal, emotional objective that our souls lean towards. I'm talking about things like lust, envy, lying, jealousy, gossip, gluttony, pride. Remember, Jesus told three of his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. In other words, Jesus is saying we can make some bad choices depending on what is dominating our emotional state. So therefore, the title today is Your Temple. Didn't realize it at the time, but I guess I kind of dress like that guy. Let's see, if I turn around, maybe, yeah. Now, once again, we're going to talk and review how to sustain an emotional state with the power of God guiding it. And therefore, our choices will reflect the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. Now, to get started, we need to look at something that we've all faced, a crisis. We each have different, like, determinations or descriptions of a crisis, but I'll just name a few. Maybe, maybe for some of us, a crisis would be um, losing our home. Some, it's losing a job. Some of it's, it's really wrapped around our relationship status. Some of us, it's our health. Some of it's our, maybe our retirement. Maybe a crisis, folks, is anything we don't have control over. Now, I think I got your attention. You need to hear this. God has a word for you today if you haven't already got one. Okay? 
In other words, God today, he's welcoming us in, and he's taking us into the, his kitchen, and he's cooking us a meal. Now, I don't deny that this meal, for some, may not taste that good. It may be a very offensive meal. It may be hard to swallow. But if you'll take bite-sized pieces and swallow this meal, I guarantee you it's going to be food for your soul. It's going to be healthy for you, and it's going to feed you properly. See, within the Bible, whenever we are reading about something we would refer to as a crisis, maybe the Bible even refers to it as a crisis, God would do something powerful or great in the very midst of that issue. In fact, I don't even think God refers to anything as a crisis. It's our own terminology that creates or classifies things as a crisis. But you know what? It seems for some reason... The only thing we seem to be known for in life are the things that we overcome. In fact, I think it would be accurate to say that history is really the recording of these challenges or these crises. Many of the people we read in our history books are there because of the crisis they overcame. In this book called the Bible, where we get all our guidance from, we've got people like mm, Abraham and Sarah, couldn't have kids. Joseph in his coat of many colors, David facing a giant, Esther and Haman, Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and of course, Jesus. Those are just a few examples of how to master our emotional state and keep it going. See, we have to be objective about ourselves so we can be self-aware and take a good, hard look at what you see in the mirror. And then, once you take a good, hard look, you need to understand that we have a choice. And you, that person you see in the mirror can change your state. You can adjust yourself based on what you noticed about yourself when you're looking in the mirror. And then you stay committed towards that to what would be called a breakthrough. Amen? Folks, whatever you're going through right now, is the exact hour God has set up for you to be remembered. <laughs> Here's the deal. It's not about you. It's about the assignment God has created for you that will have an impact for eternity. That's why you'll be remembered. See, Jesus went through a crisis on the cross, and we cannot forget him, can we? A crisis is an event that God uses to show he is bigger than the circumstance and he uses us to overcome it to show the rest of the world. Now the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now we've heard this many times and it's a very nice encouraging scripture. But it's a hard pill to swallow. See, it's tough when you, you may lose your job or you just lost your house to foreclosure or, you know, the death of a, of a family member, a, a divorce or a sickness, and, and then we're supposed to say, this is for my good? That can be frustrating and confusing if we don't understand how God will use what the devil meant for destruction. See, for many, this becomes a form of, and I've heard this already this morning in the worship room, because it's unbelievable how this all ties in. But what this happens to many of us, it becomes a form of depression or fear or trauma, anxiety, frustration, loneliness, abandonment, anger, worry, which then leads some people to have the impact of suicide. Biblical truth about a crisis, folks, is that it is only seasonal. Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Scripture tells us right there, to everything there is a season. And therefore, a major key is to remember to remain steady while you are going through a challenging season. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything, and a season for every activity under heaven. Folks, if you're going through a tough time right now, then be encouraged by the Word of God because it cannot last. Because everything has a season. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you, 
that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, <laughs> what I've witnessed is I've done this, but I've cautioned and I've checked myself now, but I continue to watch a lot of people. So I've watched and a lot of people claim selective promises from God's word. We'll say things like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My God shall supply all my needs. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen. But here's one we don't, I don't hear very often. In this world, we will have tribulation. God said it. Did he not? Okay. Remember now, remember, our faith did not create the issue. Our faith is, its work is to sustain us through these days and overcome them. Jesus says, if you follow me and you believe my word, you will be like a man who built his house on a rock. The storms came, the winds blew, the waves rose, and the great clash hit the house, and the house stood firm. But he also says, if you don't follow my word, your house will be like the man who built on sand. It's going to collapse. Folks, unfortunately, we sometimes process that when we come to receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, when we get to that humble place, when we bow our knee, when we submit to him, and we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, for some reason, we either believe we become or we think we're going to become immune to affliction. Some of us are saying, well, I go to church, I serve in the church, I faithfully give tithes and offerings, I was faithful, but why did I lose my job? Folks, because we believe in Jesus does not insulate us from the storms, but what it does do is it guarantees our house will never fall. Because you overcome. Listen, the issue is not whether we have a crisis or not. The issue is, what are you built on? <laughs> right? See, we've got to renew our minds to align our minds with God's Word. We can't just selectively pick and choose. We need to take it all in. So when the storms come, it doesn't come to destroy us. It comes to give us the opportunity to prove what we were built on. <laughs> See, what's going on here again? Welcome to Freedom Destiny. We're talking about spiritual maturity, folks. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual transformation here. And you know what? Our soul is not particularly fond of this. Our soul just wants to not... It's like a kid trying to eat its vegetables. If they don't like vegetables, they'll just like trap door, trap door right? And you've got to like pry it open. Remember, I'm telling you, take bite-sized pieces here. Or you're going to spit it back out. This is not milk today. This is meat this is solid meat of God to help us both discern good and evil. See, why does our emotional state fluctuate from moment to moment? It's because God designed our emotional state to reveal the byproduct of whatever it is that we're focusing on. And whatever it is that we're saying to ourselves. And whatever our, our body is doing when everything's going on around us. See, our emotional state is one of the quickest and easiest tools to check how we're doing as a Christian. That's all. Like, if you're frowning after something just happened to you, and you start talking to yourself, saying things like, well, this always happens to me. I guarantee you, it's a fact, I guarantee you, your emotional state will be disempowered. Did you, did you not, listen to what Melissa Rodriguez was sharing as she was exhorting us this morning. How, she, how her emotional state, she's like, she's probably doing one of these too, she probably didn't tell you. She's probably tapping the old foot, waiting. We've all, we've all been, been there, right? But what happened? She started to realize because she kept this shut, she used the scripture to tell us, Keep this shut because it's going to discourage the situation and take over that at territory. No, she listened. And then this person that was having a rough time, she was able to pour out the meat of the Word of God to encourage her. I mean, that's the deal. See, the Bible teaches us, folks, that no matter what circumstances come up, creating this pressure or creating chaos or distress, as a Christian, it shouldn't matter to us to the point that it pulls us off of our assignment. Do you see? Melissa realized, she shared with us, her assignment that day was to encourage that lady behind the deli. 
There was a distraction of two other people that she thought was her assignment, but no. Her assignment was to be used by God and not to satisfy herself. Do, do, you, do you see this? This is where we all have these opportunities. See, because the state we're in, your temple, is independent of circumstances. See, many of us rationalize when things are chaotic, when things are tough, we will say, well, anybody would be upset by these circumstances. Fair enough. But who are you? As a Christian, we need to believe that we're not just anybody, but a supernatural born-again creature created by God. And the reality is, I may not be living up to that right now. I might not even be looking like it right now. And maybe up to this very moment, as I'm hearing this, I don't even know who I am. But God didn't tell me I was dependent on the circumstances, but in fact, God said the exact opposite. Jesus talks directly about this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus is telling the disciples this, that stuff is going to happen that is going to make this world shake violently. It's going to make this world come crashing down. But through it all, Jesus is saying, do not be distracted, but grab a hold of the reality that you could control how you respond. Folks, in other words, we are to own what's going on inside of us because if we don't take ownership, somebody else will, and he's willing and waiting. His name's Satan, right? Remember now that whatever we classify as a crisis has not created your emotional state. That event, whatever that crisis is, only magnifies the emotional pattern that you have decided to define yourself. You're, if you're freaking out, that's just throwing a temper tantrum. Now, as a two-year-old, you go, wow, look at that temper tantrum. I'm a two-year-old. But you know what? I see it all the time, and I think you know what I'm talking about. Right? Our faith is only as strong as the test it survives. Right? So, so here's the deal. So matter, no matter how much faith you confess, confess it all day long. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> the test you're going through right now will prove it. Jesus taught them over and over and over and over and over and over, whenever you make a confession, it will be tested. I mean, come on, remember what Peter told Jesus, I will never leave you, and Jesus is going, okay, pal, get ready, because now you're going to be tested. This is a spiritual principle, folks. It's a spiritual principle. Whenever we make a confession in the body of Christ, we attract the testing of that confession. But here's the rub now within Christianity. It gets a little friction here. In order for us to live within the very body of Christ, we can't receive things without confessing them. But when we confess them, they will be tested to see if it's authentic or if it's fake. See, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And that's why, after people do that, many, many times people will say, my life was fine until it became a follower of Jesus Christ, and now I have all these problems. The reason for that is you've confessed, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. Jesus says, anyone who will live godly in Christ, take up your cross daily. Not yearly, not once a year, not once a quarter, not once a month, not once a week. Every day, if you're a Christian. John 16, 1 through 4, Jesus is speaking again. He says, these things I have spoken to you so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So he's telling him this when we live. This is for us. This is for you and I, right? Jesus is telling us that some crises are going to come. And when that stuff comes, don't be surprised. Don't freak out. Folks, many Christians are shocked in America at what is happening because they have been sheltered from difficult times. You know that generation we call the greatest generation that's pretty much all died off, those that, you know, did World War II? Well, remember what they had a decade before them? The Depression. War was nothing compared to a depression. They lived without for a long time. Well, guess what's going on now in America? We're fat, dumb, and happy, and guess what? Every time the littlest thing happens, oh, my toe hurts. 
because we haven't been we haven't gone through the proper training you that same thing in the video the video we just watched what do you mean I, I can't I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to buy it before I have it no you don't buy stuff unless you have it it's that simple but guess what majority of the country's in debt and they laugh at that video we laughed at the video many of you are here and I hope you're convicted by it because you shouldn't be buying stuff if you can't afford it you just don't buy it well wait I want to get what they have well you can't afford it you can't do it they're in debt why do you want to be in debt this is the truth this is what's going on right and I want to I want to encourage somebody right now because some of you have lost your job but remember <laughs> We were not born to be employed. We were born to be deployed. Let me explain. This is some more meat, so you better cut it up. If the pieces are too big, you better cut it up some more. Or re-listen to this. Right? Because it's for your temple to make it strong. For some of us, our job is more important than our work. And if that's the case then you better not lose your job. See, unfortunately, our society has taught people that they have to live for a job, and then that has distracted many people from finding their work. What do I mean? Let me explain some more. For instance, it wasn't that long ago that nobody had to go to their jobs on Sunday. It was in my lifetime. See, your job is what you're paid to do, but your work is what you were born to do. What I'm referring to when you hear the word work is what the scriptures call our giftings or our callings. Your gift is more important than your skill. Your skill is what you've been trained to do, but your gift is what God has blessed you with. Romans chapter 11, verse 29. For God's gift, gifts and his call are irrevocable. He never withdraws them once they are given, and he does not change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. So, if you lost your job, there is life after your job. Meaning, if you lose your job, they can never take away your gift or the assignment God has for you. You have to look at this eternally and not temporally. And it's your gifting, folks, that makes you prosperous in the eternal perspective. Scripture says in Proverbs 18, 16, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. It's a man's gift, not his job. Listen, if you are unemployed today, God is telling you to find your gifting or your calling. See, your gifting or your calling will sustain you when you lose your job. The kingdom of God follows the spirit of gifting, and this is why what you were born to do is more important than what you were trained to do. You've got to find out what your gifts and callings are and get aligned with that. That's why so many people are not satisfied with their jobs. How many times have you heard an employee say, well, this is just my job. I'm still searching for something better, something that I feel called to do. But see, many of us get depressed over these types of events, and depression is a result of the ex exception that things, that, like the exceptions, that things are never going to change. You just think it's always going to be this way. But let's look at the beginning and look why God created us. Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. See, God makes man in his image to manage this earth. We're made in his image. And he made us to repopulate this because we're like him and he wants us to take care of this planet. See, he makes this beautiful planet, but he didn't allow anything to grow or nothing was allowed to prosper. Why? Because there wasn't a manager yet. He hadn't created man yet. God made us. He always expected us to steward his creation. Here's where that principle of stewardship comes in. In other words... God will never allow growth where there is no management. And see, that doesn't mean things don't grow. They just grow with a lot of weeds in it. But in an upcoming season, the weeds will be revealed and then there is no harvest in the weeds. 
In other words, if we don't steward properly, we will just stay stagnant until we, are, we show we are growing in stewardship. See, here's one of the prayers we should be praying. We should pray for the ability to manage and steward things by praying to receive things from God. And understand, if you, if you pray to God to reveal these things, get ready for what he's going to reveal on how you're not properly stewarding. He's going to show things in your time, talent, treasure, and testimony that aren't properly of him, that are weeds. That's what he's going to show you. You've got to grab a hold of this concept. See, our loving father, and he is a loving father, okay, will withhold things from us if we can't manage him because he's a loving father. Our soul now, mind, will, and emotion, wants things we can't manage. Oh boy, does it ever. We didn't, God didn't allow it to rain because there was no man to manage the results of the rain. So then God creates man. And again, this is a biblical concept here. It's a principle. Whatever we mismanage, we will lose. If we pray for a new house and, and God sees the apartment bills and the unpaid and the mess that's in there and the unkemptness in an apartment... <laughs> He's waiting to see if you can get that stuff right. Right? God gives us what he, we show him and we can manage. If we mismanage our body, it goes to pot. If we mismanage our marriage, well, we might lose it. If we mismanage our children, well, <laughs> look at our culture. If we mismanage our money, what? We're in debt. <laughs> That's why we need to continue and pray for wisdom with understanding of our needs versus our wants. That's why I want to implore on you, please take advantage of this wonderful financial counseling that's going to be provided here. Just sign up. Be humble. Don't be concerned about if other people see your name on a piece of paper. For goodness sakes, just don't be concerned. Go seek help. They can help you. They'll be in your corner. They'll put their arm around you. They'll have somebody to hold you accountable. That's all you need. That's all you need. And you'll get out of debt. Hmm. See, when a crisis reveals itself, it reduces us to what we need. See, when crisis comes, we get a better handle on what we need versus what we want. See, many today want a bigger whatever, bigger house, bigger car, better whatever. So they overextend themselves and have to put in more hours at their job, and in the process, then they have no family life. And then what happens? That's the offshoot of no family life. Their marriage starts suffering. And then the, the children are lost because they have no adult you know, leadership except for what's on the TV or the Internet or on social media. Right? And then God will allow a crisis to foreclose on that house because you're focusing so hard on the keeping the house, but that's not what you need. It's what you want. So you'll lose the home. And in this entire process, you're coming back to the basics, which are what? God relationships and love your family see we tend to curse at crises and God is saying folks I allow this because you are too stubborn to listen to me so you have left me no choice but to break you down and remember these were your free will choices that got you in this place in the first place and I understand this food may be hard to swallow but if but it's like this it's like a crisis is like a love letter from God. <laughs> it may sound like an oxymoron to you, but it really is. Here's something else. Crises produce promotion. <laughs> it's the truth. Folks, it's during a time such as we have right now that your gift comes alive and you're ready for promotion. God will always reduce us to him, and that is why he allows crisis so we return to him because his arms are waiting for us, right? Pharaoh, Pharaoh thought he was, you know, was a god until the plagues came upon Egypt, and Pharaoh admitted there was a god more powerful than he was. And like Pharaoh, we get so prosperous, we forget God, and God withdraws things to reduce us to him. Nebuchadnezzar, he had the same problem, pride. Crises come to readjust us and recalibrate us towards a relationship with God. It's very important to understand that a crisis should alert us to the basics. See, whatever we tolerate, whatever we tolerate will never change. It's never going to change. I mean, you can, and you're going to be able to find people that agree with you, especially now since we got social media. 
You can find people that'll bitch and moan with you about whatever it is you want to bitch and moan about. Is that not the truth? And then you'll feel, you'll feel justified because you found just one more person or a group of people to agree with you. And then when you look in the mirror and you go, yeah, I know I got to change. I know the word says that, but they said I don't have to. And so now I got my friends. And God goes, go ahead. Go get from them what you want from me because I ain't going to give it to you because you're not ready for it. See, whatever we tolerate will never change. And see, a crisis comes to shake up the wrong stinking thinking we are allowing in our lives that are against the word of God. In other words, a crisis is the cradle of our character. We need to ask, whose character are we going to emulate to get out of the crisis, God or man? You know, it, this kind of helped me to understand this too. Have, have you ever begun a project, like a do-it-yourself project, and halfway through it doesn't look like the end result will be <laughs> anything prosperous? Right? The process in itself can look and be very chaotic at times, sometimes to the point that you... After you've begun it, you doubt if you're even pr proceeding correctly. You begin to ask all kinds of questions like, what in the world did I get myself into? Right? What in the world was I thinking? And then we'll make declarations like, I can't do this anymore. I should have left well enough alone. Folks, here's the deal. Change looks like chaos until it's completed. We are constantly asking God to change something or fix something in our lives, but we want everything to happen instantly. When things start shifting, we get anxious and nervous and start crying out for help or even asking God to stop the process before it's done. We must understand that the process may get uncomfortable. It may even get messy. But we have to keep our focus on the end result. I'm going to ask the band to return to the stage. And as they're doing that, let's read Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Follow along. And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who be began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up to the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. So, so we have to continue to have faith that if God brought us to it, he will bring us through it. Okay? So, in other words, we just got to take a chill pill, find freedom in the fact that there is nothing too big for God, no matter what the it looks like through our carnal eyes. God is still God, and even in the midst of chaos, He will complete the work that He has started within you. So the next time you want to give up while change is taking place around you, remember how good that closet or that garage looked once you sorted through it all and got rid of all the mess and the chaos and threw some things away. Remember how that do-it-yourself project turned out when you finally put the finishing touches on it. Be encouraged and continually move forward regardless of the chaos that may surround you and, and remember this. Change, as you're looking at that temple, and that's each one of us, change looks like chaos until it's completed, folks. See, too often we, you'll hear this, because you've heard this before, those that have come here, you've heard me talk about this stuff. You've heard this, and you'll make great, you'll, you'll say, gosh, that's really good, or you'll be very quiet, like many of you were today, because I think maybe you're using your knife and fork, which is good, and taking bite-sized pieces. But let it digest. Do not throw it back up. Let the meat of the Word of God get in there and give you nourishment for your soul. It's got to break down. So it's a process. It's not instant. This is things you've got to do over and over and over. So you need to be encouraged by people who might have done this a little longer, who have been down that trail you're going and don't want you to go down that. And they want to help you. Hallelujah. Now, we partake in communion here. It's in the back. Okay? It's by the lights. You can bring the lights down. It's by the lamps. And, and we partake in the, in the altar ministry. And I gave you the scripture. You heard it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. You're going to have to confess something. 
going to have to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Folks, there's, 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 uh -uh. you're not a Christian unless you confess and believe. So you've got to confess, but guess what comes with it? It's a whole package. It comes some testing. You're going to have people go, you did what? That's the same thing we did last week in a water baptism that shows that's an outward sign of an inward change. So folks, let this meat of the Word of God nourish you. Participate in communion if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And come to your feet and continue praising and worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.